Hi, I'm Gary, and this is episode 176 of EV Musings, a podcast about renewables, electric vehicles, and things that are interesting to electric vehicle owners. On the show today, we'll be talking all things EV related in a discussion with Fully Charged Show presenter, Jack Scarlett. This season of the podcast is sponsored by ZapMap, the free-to-download app that helps EV drivers search, plan, and pay for their charging. Before we start, I wanted to let you know that we're coming to the end of this season of the podcast. I'll be looking at who we want to get on next season. So far, I've got Adrian Keane from Instavolt, Sarah Merrick from Ripple Energy, and Guinness World Record hypermiler Kevin Booker talking about getting the best efficiency out of your EV. More to follow. Our main topic of discussion today is new cars and the tipping point of EV adoption. With all the best will in the world, something like the Mercedes Vision EQXX will only ever be a niche vehicle in the big scheme of things. So how do we see the next few years going? Is there one car that will open EVs to the masses or one specific mark? The Chinese manufacturers are the 800-pound gorilla, but will they be the ones to crack it? Or will Tesla bring out the Model 2 and blow the rest of them away? What about the legacy manufacturers? Who will survive and who will go the way of Nokia? Obviously, I have my views and opinions on this, but I wanted to bring in somebody who's a bit of an authority on this particular subject, which is why I'm delighted to welcome Jack Scarlett for the Fully Charged Show back to the channel. Hello, Gary. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Now, last time you were on the show was the round table at the end of Series 5, which was Episode 100. And I believe you talked about, should Tesla open their network to other OEMs? Since then, of course, that particular topic has moved on and we're now at the stage where it is a thing. Now, I know you drive a Polestar. Have you had the opportunity to use the Tesla supercharging network? I I certainly have. First of all, I can't take credit for the opening up. That was largely Elon. I can't personally take any of the... uh take any of the plaudits for the the network opening up. It is fantastic though, isn't it? I, I use the Tesla supercharging network wherever possible. I will take detours to make use of the supercharging network because it is simply the best. Uh, They have a good number of chargers at every location. They work pretty much instantaneously. They are hellishly expensive if you are a non-Tesla driver. But as with all rapid charging, I'm not sitting there brimming my battery. I'm sitting there getting just enough to get me home and then I'm doing slow, cheap charging when I get back to my house. So the answer is yes, I use them whenever I can. They are wonderful. And I think it's a huge... um, it's this huge feather in Tesla's cap that they have done this because it speaks to the company truly being about uh, mass EV adoption and you know accelerating this energy transition as opposed to just having the biggest personal market share. You know because that's they've, they've hurt themselves by doing that. That that was an exclusively Tesla benefit, and now it's not. So so fair play to them. Now what what do you think will happen now? Now obviously in the UK we have I think it's fifteen of the. 100 sites that are actually open to everybody. Do you think they will expand that or are they just going to keep a a subset there? What's your considered view on that? Ultimately, yes, I would imagine so. I think having these kind of one make charging facilities simply doesn't make sense in a world of mass EV adoption. And so far, I've not heard any super critical feedback from Tesla owners. I think that's one thing they're especially cautious of is not alienating their loyal customers by inconveniencing them. So I think they're doing a really good job of slowly and carefully rolling it out while monitoring you know, traffic at these sites and ensuring that they're not creating long queues for, for Tesla owners. So I think if, if they can continue to do it in a sort of careful and progressive way, I, I see no reason why not. I think I totally agree with you. Uh, now, moving on, you more than most people, are quite well positioned to know and understand the new EV car market, at least from the point of view of what's out there and what's available. Uh, Side question, do you know how many different vehicles you've reviewed since joining the fully charged team? Gosh, I I dare not even think about it. I think I probably have averaged, gosh, it's probably about 50 episodes a year over two years. Not all of those have been cars. So I'm going to take a wild guess and say 70. I, I don't know. I shall find out. I'll, I'll put it in the show notes for anybody who's interested. But oh, Please, yeah, I'd be fascinated <laughs> to know. 
Now, we can't ignore the elephant in the room, which is the Chinese manufacturers. Now, it was interesting that at Fully Charged Live this year, there were more Chinese manufacturers than European ones. And only Nissan and the Korean manufacturers came over from the Far East. Will EVs go the way of the motorbike where Eastern Imports, Yamaha, Suzuki and Honda took over from the entrenched manufacturers? Yeah, it was quite a thing, wasn't it, Gary, seeing the, you know, the significant presence of some of those Chinese brands at Fully Charged Live a couple of weeks ago and just the, the notable absence of some of the uh, you know, renowned legacy car makers here in Europe. It's, it's a tidal wave. There's a tidal wave of Chinese cars coming to Europe in the very near future. It's already started and they are very, very good. They've got really good software. I, no, what was interesting is I've, I've, the first few Chinese EVs that landed in Europe were really focused on that kind of entry level market, which is criminally underserved. So it's sort of a free hit, you know, as long as it's not absolutely terrible, which the MG4 is not, which the BYD Dolphin is not, they're going to do well because they have no competition. But last week I drove the Xpeng P7. Have you come across that car? I believe I've seen pictures of it around the place. Yeah. It was absolutely staggering. It's a big, fast, swoopy, sporty looking four-door saloon type thing. It is, mm-hmm. you know, the pitch that I present in the video is it's a Tesla Model S rival for Tesla Model 3 money. And, and that's how it feels. It's, it's a huge step forward compared to some of its rivals. So th- they're not just good at doing the cheap and cheerful stuff. They're just really good at these cars. And without question, they're going to eat up a huge market share in years to come, much a, a much higher percentage of people are going to begin buying Chinese cars, um, and I'm, I'm I'm cautiously optimistic that there will then be a latent response from some of the legacy OEMs. I don't think that this is mass extinction. I think some of them are doing everything they can to guarantee that they won't survive the decade. But I'm sure that some of these legacy car brands that we know and love will find creative ways of of surviving in the electric future, despite having started a little bit slowly. We're going to see more collaboration between European and Chinese brands, like we've seen with the Smart brand, for example, which is now kind of Geely engineering and software wrapped in Mercedes design and you know soft touch materials. And another interesting approach that I'm seeing increasingly from some of the brands that we more associate with affordable cars, um, Ford and Vauxhall come to mind, is a radical simplification of the lineup. So I've got a couple of fun numbers for you here. Um, Ford had a 19-car lineup, I believe globally, this time last year. By the end of this year, it will be eight cars. And then Vauxhall, similar, similarly, I went and had a look at the new Astra E. It wasn't long ago that there was a total of 362 different derivatives of Vauxhall that you could buy. So that's models, and then trims, and then different specy bits. 362, that number is going to come down to 65 in the next year or two. So they're, they're, they're clearly, you know, the lineup's got a bit bloated. And uh, in order to reduce cost, in order to make building electric cars a bit more financially viable, what we're seeing some of these brands doing is really simplify their lineup and just focus on doing a handful of things really well. And that makes a whole lot of sense to me. So the answer is yes, there's going to be a huge influx of Chinese cars. And that's a good thing for the consumer because they're bloody good. But I don't think that this is end times for all the car brands that we have been buying for the last century here in Europe. Well, you've touched on a couple of things that I want to talk about. Let's sort of stay in the cheaper end of the market. If we look at things like the BYD Seagull, now these are pitched as cheap and cheerful because they sell for really low costs in their native countries. I think the Seagull is the equivalent of either nine or ten thousand pounds, something like that in in China. But when they come across to the UK and Europe, the regulations mean changes which tend to bump the price up. Will we ever have a new EV with respectable range for less than, say, 20,000 in the UK? When, when's that going to happen? It's a fantastic question. You know, I, our, our man in China, Elliot Richards, um, talked to me about this just the other day. And he, he suggested that a large part of the reason for that markup is that Chinese brands are just so afraid of being Um, disregarded as kind of bargain basement brands if they were to bring them here for those same prices. So it's not just regulation. There is a very deliberate markup going on just in order to be taken seriously, which is hugely annoying to think about. I'm not sure that there will be, Gary. I I don't know if the the days of the sub 20,000 pound car 
are going to be around for all that much longer. Unfortunately, that's just the way it's going. You know, what's what's the what's the price of an entry level ICE VW Golf this day these days? I think it's it's in the low to mid twenties. Um, cars are getting bigger. The smaller cars are being killed off. Ford have just axed the Fiesta, which is devastating. Um, as a as a man who learned to drive in a Fiesta. So uh, unfortunately, I'm not sure that we are going to see the really, really, really cheap stuff. And I think that brings us on to a conversation about, well, what is there underneath the car? How could the micro car potentially offer a solution here to city dwellers who don't need a car that often? What about no car at all? What about a big cargo bike? And I, maybe it's kind of, sounds like kind of victim blaming to go, oh, you can't afford a car, buy a bike. But I do think that this uh, energy transition offers a really exciting opportunity to to really scrutinize the modes of transport that we use and ask the question, do I really need all that cargo space and five tons of mass around me simply to pop to the shops or do the school run? It's almost like you've got a list of the questions or the topics that I want to discuss because you keep picking them in advance of me actually asking you the questions. God, we're um, so in <laughs> sync, Gary. It's, it's like we're <laughs> two halves of the same mind. <laughs> There are a couple of OEMs uh, who've either made it clear that they're not interested in electric vehicles or they've made moves, but they're way behind the curve. Uh, I mean, the list of OEMs that fully charge who, quote, declined to participate is quite telling. Do we think that the likes of <coughs> Honda and <coughs> Toyota might catch up? Where where do we see them going medium and long term? <sighs> It's a great question. You know, I, I, I think cynically, there's probably some value in letting your, your competitors go first, watching them make mistakes and then learning from them mistakes and, and not having to make them yourselves. I would imagine that that's quite central to the thinking of some of these brands who are really taking their time. But um, I think they really underestimate the value in sort of getting your reps in as it were. So if you look at Kia and Hyundai, who we always kind of look at as the sort of poster child for how to do it right as a legacy car brand, how to seize this opportunity of the energy transition with both hands. You know, they started making electric cars uh, in a really meaningful way several years ago now. And those early Kia Souls and E-Neros and Konas weren't especially pretty, but they got really good at the hardware early on. And now they're so good at the hardware that they have the luxury of having time to think about, you know, brand redesigns and a fancy new logo and funky new styling. And the, the result is some of the most desirable and well-rounded electric cars on the market. Compare that to something like the new Subaru Solterra, which I drove earlier this year. That's the very first electric car from Subaru. And it sure does feel like the first electric car from a brand because it's got 100 miles less range than it claims to have and the efficiency is woeful and they've just made silly little errors. So I think uh, I think the brands that went early are really benefiting from that and some of the ones who are lagging behind have really misjudged the situation. Um, and I think they find themselves in a stickier situation than perhaps they realized. Again, I'll refer to our man Elliot in China who was at the Shanghai Motor Show for us a couple of weeks ago. And he claims to have genuinely witnessed a load of um, execs from one of the major German legacy car, car brands walking around the show just kind of with their head in their hands and their jaws on the floor. You know, he was witnessing these high-ranking um, legacy car brand execs having the realization that they are screwed. Um, and I think there's going to be a lot of that in the coming months. I could just picture that. No, so looping back to something you mentioned earlier, you've reviewed a number of the uh, quirky vehicles, which are currently not mainstream, but have a lot of potential. And you mentioned them earlier, the, the Microlino, the Citroen, Oli, and the Ami, for example. Now, the considered opinion, and Robert Llewellyn has stated this on several occasions, is that we need to be buying fewer cars. Are vehicles like that a realistic substitute for cars, or are they just fun novelties? What do you reckon? I think they could and should play a huge part in how we get around our cities in the future. Um, and I think they really lend themselves to a model where we don't necessarily own our vehicles. So I'll, I'll use the Squad Solar as an example, which is the one that I drove most recently. It's, it's made by a Dutch company. It's actually two ex-Lightyear guys 
um, who are just sort of tinkering around in a shed. It's essentially a golf buggy with a giant solar panel on the roof. And they won't mind me saying that because that's what they say as well. It's a wonderful thing. And, you know, driving that around Breda, which is a very small town in the Netherlands, you kind of have this thought of, well, imagine if there was three of these parked on the end of every residential road waiting to be rented for a few quid per, you know, 15 minutes. You unlock it with your phone, you drop it off on a designated street corner when you're done with it. If those were absolutely everywhere and if, if they were as affordable to rent as, you know, the electric bikes that we currently have around London, what percentage of Londoners would no longer need a car at all? You know, what, what percentage of Londoners would that do the vast majority of their, of their travel? It's an exciting thought. And I think that's a, I think that's a really key role that those little micro cars could play is just reducing the number of big full size cars on the road in our cities, both driving around and parked outside people's houses. Again, you've mentioned something which I wanted to talk about in a few minutes, but you've, you've jumped ahead because we're so in sync. Uh, so <laughs> let's talk about the Lightyear one. I mean, we, we had the Lightyear one, we had the Sonus Scion, former guest in the podcast, and there I think we can safely say that as concepts, they were great, but they failed to take that next step into mm. uh, production. Now, we've got other companies out there who are in a similar situation. We've got Fisker, we've got Munro, even Rivian. Can you foresee other casualties in the uh, pure electric space? A hundred percent. You would have to be... I said this to Henrik Fisker's face on a stage last week, and I hope it didn't come across as rude. You would have to be absolutely bonkers to launch a new car brand, especially at this moment in time. And happily for us, there are some brilliantly bonkers geniuses like him doing precisely that, despite the fact that it's the maddest thing that you can do. The thing about launching a new car brand is, even if you have a fantastic idea, that's not enough to guarantee success. Even if you have invented the thing that's going to change the world, you still need to convince a lot of investors to throw money at you with absolutely no clear timeline for when they might see a nickel back. And that's the thing about engineering. It's an iterative process. There will be a zillion things that come up that you didn't anticipate that need tweaking and, and, and another month of money and fettling. You know, the example that Henrik Fisker gave to me the other day, he was just about ready to launch the ocean in the US. And he sent them the car um, to, you know, sort of the, uh, what are they called? The, the DMV to have a look at and register. And they went, oh, hang on, the noise it emits isn't quite enough decibels for US roads because the level of noise electric vehicles have to emit is different in America to Europe. So that's, that's another month. That's, that's way more cost and way more faff than you think to fix before then going back. And the average investor just doesn't understand that iterative process of engineering. Um, and is going to get impatient and not want to put even more money in when you ask them. That's on top of the fact that you have to com convince these supply chains to work with you. You know, you're talking to Brembo. Can I have some brakes, please? They kind of go, well, yeah, maybe. But the thing is, you might not be around in two months. Whereas Audi, I've been giving them brakes for 50 years and they always pay me on time. So why, why would I work with you? It is a brutal, thankless process trying to get these new car brands off the ground. And I mourn Sono Scion and the Light Year Zero because they were beautiful, beautiful ideas. But, uh, you know, due to a, an array of circumstances, it just wasn't viable at this moment in time. It is really interesting watching some of the, the next round, as it were, of new car makers and some of the kind of things that they are preemptively doing to increase their chances of survival. Um, so a couple of examples, Munro, uh, almost entirely B2B. You know, that vehicle is focused on commercial usage. And as such, they're landing pre-orders, you know, in the tens, not for individual units. And that's really, really um, boosting their chances of success. Uh, another great example is Squad Solar, circling back to them. When I say it's a couple of X light year guys, I do literally mean it's a couple of X light year guys in a shed with some spanners. They've just decided to do the whole thing themselves because you know, by keeping your costs as low as possible, you give yourself as much runway as possible financially. And they've, they've now reached a point where they've got this really advanced prototype and they do need to hire some more people because they sort of need like, you know, a marketing team and a sales team. Um, but it's been really interesting to watch these 
new car brands, learn from one another's mistakes and just navigate that treacherous, treacherous road to production um, as, as carefully as they can. Every sort of manufacturer who's in this uh, space, who's in that situation where they're starting up, they've got something which they know is good. They're all looking at Elon Musk and Tesla and they're going, well, he was in the same situation and look at where he is now. And it's interesting how whilst many of them have started in the same situation, there's not many have taken that extra leap and, and been able to commercialize, uh, the products that they, that they want to sell and they've been able to do. I mean, you, you know, you talked about marketing and, and Tesla's famous for not actually having any marketing at all. It lets the product sell. And the whole way that they've actually managed, that Tesla's have actually managed to do that is fascinating when you consider that I don't think they've done anything that's radically different than uh, anybody else in the past. They've just managed to make it work. And yet there are so many out there who think they can do the same thing and they've just fallen short. It's, it's a bit of a conundrum, isn't it? Yeah, you're so right. The more I learn about just how incredibly challenging it is to get a new car brand off the ground, the more and more admiration I have for what Tesla achieved you know, long before anyone was even taking electric cars seriously. They pulled that off at a time when no one even wanted to buy an electric car. It's, it's an astonishing feat. Uh, no marketing except for the um, increasingly manic tweetings of the man in charge, of course, by the way. Oh, well, absolutely. That goes without saying. <laughs> can, we, um, can we talk electric car conversions? Now, a bit of a niche market at the moment, but many people want to be able to keep their cherished you know, Porsche 911 or VW Beetle. Where do you see the conversion market going? Will it ever be something more than a niche or are there going to be a lot of people who go, well, I, can, I like the car I'm driving at the moment. It may be a fossil fuel burner, but if I could whip the engine out, stick a motor and some batteries in, I'd keep it. It's a lovely thought, isn't it? I'm really into that whole space, partly because I love cars and I want to see some of the pre-EV, pre-EV ice cars, that's what they're called. I want to see cars from the ICE era survive and have new life breathed into them. Um, it is a kind of indulgent hobbyist's pursuit at the moment because of the sheer cost involved. Um, and there's a number of reasons it's so expensive at the moment. So to give you some idea, um, there's a company called Felten who can EV convert your classic mini. Um, but to do that costs you a classic mini plus give or take 40 grand. It's very expensive. And that's obviously because you need a big battery and you need the motors, but it's also because these guys are pioneers at the moment. You know, they're not just pulling up a database downloading the requisite componentry and brackets and 3D printing them using templates that already exist. They are making the templates for the brackets and the bits and the bobs from scratch. So, so these guys are <laughs> they're doing all the legwork that will make the process of EV converting uh, old cars much cheaper and faster in the future. Um, and it will get cheaper as a result of that. But speaking to Chris Hazel, who's the CEO of Felton, I, I asked him this very question on stage a couple of weeks ago. I said, will this ever be for more than hobbyists? Is there a future where someone, someone's grandmother who just doesn't really fancy buying a new car is quite fond of the old beta that she has? Is there a future where she can just go to the garage and have that cheaply and quickly EV converted you know, for, for substantially less than the cost of a new electric car? And Chris said, unlikely. Sadly, we have a very limited amount of time to get it down to that level of affordability because in 10 to 15 years, everyone will be driving electric and the ship will have sailed in that regard. So it's, it's a shame because there's a few billion cars on the road currently and would be somewhat more sustainable of us to make use of as many of those as possible instead of pushing everyone into new vehicles. But regrettably, the, the people smarter than me have explained to me that it will likely remain a somewhat expensive hobbyist's pursuit but I still think it has immense value to add, even as just that. I, for one, want to buy a big old obnoxious American land yacht, you know, something with a lot of chrome on the face and uh, an EV convert that. I just enjoy the juxtaposition of a sort of seven meter long, formerly V8 American something silently wafting through traffic. That sounds fantastic. I was a Porsche 911 driver for 10 years and I'd love to go back to one of those, but with an electric uh, motor underneath. So 
But which, when we talk about uh, which one did so, you have? Which one? Which generation? Uh, oh, I started with the. I had a 1979 um, 911SC. Then I had a 964 Targa. Then I had a 996 Targa, the Carrera Four versions. Lovely, fantastic cars. Passed everything except the uh, petrol station. That's for sure. I've driven an EV converted 964 um, by Everati, and they asked, you know, the, the 911 is like the that's the last bastion for petrol heads, right? If you want to trigger petrol heads, then you'd tear the engine out of a Porsche 911 and put some batteries in. <laughs> um, but no, n- knowing that, they've done it with such love and attention to the point where they weigh the car front and rear and they fit the batteries strategically so that the weight distribution and the total weight remain exactly the same once it's EV converted. So it still feels rear heavy like a 911. Um, it was absolutely terrifying, that thing, by the way. I, I Anyone who says that electric cars are sterile, drive an old Porsche that's been turned electric. It's modern cars that are sterile. When you shove some batteries into an 80s sports car, you don't wish that you had more noise or gears to pull because you're hanging on for dear life. Oh, I've uh, I've never come closer to death than I was uh, one evening when I was driving the 911 SC and the back end went on me. (laughs) That was a humbling experience. Scary. Oh, indeed. Indeed. You know, well, what is it they say? I ran out of talent when it came to controlling the car. <laughs> a couple of quick things to discuss. How important is vehicle to load on a new car? It's coming on a lot of them, but not all of them. Where do you see that going? V2L, V2G, whatever you want to call it. I, I think it shall, should probably be a pretty standard feature at this moment in time. I think certainly if you're an outdoorsy type, I think the ability to power campsites and utensils off of it is exciting today, right now. As far as the kind of the the broader potential of vehicle to load as a technology, I think that's something that we're really just starting to scratch the surface of. Robert has visited Utrecht in the Netherlands a few times, which wants to be the first vehicle to load city, which is to say they've got these gigantic car parks, you know, hundreds of bays. Each bay has a vehicle to load charger, and you can do some pretty incredible things. And you've got a load of um, vehicle-to-load compatible electric cars plugged into the same system. In terms of balancing out grid demand, it's going to be an invaluable tool. And that's you know one of the kind of questions that we get from people who are new to this world is, oh, is there enough power to charge all this elect- these electric cars? The answer is yes. We just need to be cleverer about distributing it. So in that regard, very exciting. You know, you saw footage of some of the floods they had in the US last year and Ford deploying some F-150 Lightnings to, again, sort of power campsites of people whose homes were underwater. That's pretty incredible. Um, That being said, again, I did have someone tell me on stage at Fully Charged Live a couple of weeks ago that if you are just a N person looking to buy a N electric car charger for your driveway, it's maybe not an urgent requirement to spend that extra three-odd grand on a vehicle-to-load compatible charger. I, th- I don't know. It depends. I suppose there's a sense of community required. How much do you care about giving your energy back to the grid? How much do you care about contributing to um, reducing the spikes in demand on the grid? Uh, this is a point that we'll come back to a bit later on, I'm sure. This sense of, you know, I think there's almost, a, you almost need to be quite neighborly to care, right? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. We had uh, Claire Miller from Octopus Tech on. Uh, she ran the Power Loop uh, vehicle to grid. A project for Octopus. Um, and she was saying that it's going to be one of those things that's, that's split 50 50. There's going to be those who will need to buy a charger that will deal with vehicle to grid. And that's going to be the, you know, the 3,000 pounds thing that you talked about there. And then there's going to be the OEMs who are going to build the vehicle to grid capability into the vehicles and you'll be able to use it on an existing standard charger. And it's, I'm wondering whether that's going to be another one of the VHS Betamax type things, which one's going to win out as a solution. And I, I don't have the answer for that, but it's, uh, it's one of the things to be, uh, to be thought about. Can we move on quickly to induction charging? Yes or no? Because hmm. you went to Norway, didn't you, to, to look at that, didn't you? I certainly did. And, you know, as we know, Gary, there's going to, you know, petrol was the silver bullet. Uh, whatever kind of vehicle, whatever type of job needed doing, you just fill that vehicle with petrol and off you go. And that worked for everyone in all scenarios. In the electric future, we're going to need a multitude of clever solutions for specific problems. Um, so I'll give you a good use case for inductive charging. Um, in Washington state in the US, there's a fleet of buses 
and every bus is fitted with an inductive charge pad, I guess you'd call it, underneath a plate, I should say, on the underside of the bus. And every bus stop on that route has an inductive charger. And what that means is every time the bus stops, it gets a quick squirt of charge, a very, very small amount, but certainly enough to help it get to the next stop. What that has enabled the company to do is fit the buses with batteries that are a quarter of the size they would otherwise need to be, which makes them substantially cheaper, substantially more sustainable. Um, so that's a great example of a use case where, uh, you know, that, you know, those electric buses are staggeringly expensive with the big batteries fitted to them. And all of a sudden they become much more affordable, much more viable. That's quite cool and exciting. Another use case I've heard given for um, inductive charging is if you're, for example, a wheelchair user, if you're someone with physical disabilities, charging cables are quite heavy and cumbersome things, aren't they? So private, and as far as kind of private usage, that's one example that springs to mind. If you had an inductive charging mat in your driveway, you could just park up on it and head inside without even having to think twice about charging. So I think in specific use cases, I can certainly see it being uh, being a, a, a useful solution. I unfortunately can't personally see the M25 being lined with inductive charging and you know the, these ideas of the kind of the magic charging highways. Lovely thought, but I, surely that's incredibly expensive and laborious, right? Oh, you've got to think so. And Sweden's decided to do that with a couple of kilometers of of road they've announced that um, recently. And, and, you know, as a concept, yeah, but I can't see it sort of taken off in a big way for exactly that reason. You're going to have to rip the whole road up and the cost will be astronomical. Quite, quite. But yeah, again, certain use cases, maybe just maybe, could, could, could play a useful role. Uh, where are you on the whole debate of big battery with long range versus a smaller battery with faster charging? Oof. I think, generally speaking, people need way less range than they think. You know, people always say, well, you know, I drive to the Alps once a year and go skiing, so I need 500 miles of range. <laughs> my, my overused reply is, oh, well, do you wear your ski boots all year also? Absolutely not. You you, did you use them for that one week where you need them? Likewise, if 99% of your driving could be covered in a 100, 150 mile range electric vehicle, buy one of those and borrow something else for the one trip a year that you do that exceeds um, the capabilities of that vehicle. I, 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 think, I think vehicles that legitimately can go 250, 300 miles, that's surely enough for almost all use cases. You know, the fully charged um, production offices in Bristol, that's uh, it's about, what is it, about 240 miles round trip from my front door. And I, if I'm careful and sensible, which I'm often not, I can do that in my Polestar 2 without stopping to charge. And that's, that's seven hours of driving. Who on earth is doing more than that without wanting to take a nice long break and go to the loo and have some lunch, which you can then charge while you're stopping? Um, I don't really understand the use case for these five, six hundred mile, you know, super long distance electric vehicles because, you know, as Robert Llewellyn always says, the human bladder can only travel so far without needing to stop. So I think I think we're approaching the upper end of what I deem more than sufficient range for just about every use case. Um, and the next thing is just to make charging better, more abundant, more reliable, because if you knew that when you got to that service station, that the charger was going to be available, that it was going to work straight away, and it was going to be as quick as it claims it's going to be, you'd be a lot less concerned about your range. I totally agree. I think a lot of it is very much the security blanket for those people who've done, you know, 30 or 40 years of driving with uh, a three, four, 500 mile range vehicle. And they think, oh, I need that. I need that. Whereas in reality, as you've already said, they absolutely don't. Now, can we loop back and talk about Tesla? Now, there's still the 800-pound gorilla in the room. Although they haven't delivered a new car model globally for a few years now, I believe the Model we, Model we, the Model Y was released mid-pandemic, and the small EV that they've been threatened, uh, the Model 2, I think they're thinking about it, has failed to materialise so far. Are they resting on their laurels? Oof, yeah, that's that's a good question. Um, incidentally, am I right in thinking that they've just announced there there'll be no new Model S's and X's delivered to? Is it just UK or Europe for the quote foreseeable future? I know they stopped 
they stopped uh, uh, producing right-hand drive ones. So I don't know whether they've stopped deliveries to the UK or whether they're saying you can have a delivery, but it has to be a left-hand drive version. I'm not quite sure which one of those is uh, more accurate. I mean, I, I, I suppose if you are Tesla and you are selling cars faster than you can possibly build them, you're not that worried. You're not in that much of a rush to go ahead and develop some new models or even facelift your existing cars. Um, and that is the scenario at Tesla. They can't build them fast enough. They sell every Model 3 and every Model Y that rolls off the production line before it's been built. Are they resting on their laurels? I, potentially, yes. I think maybe. You know, to me, the gap it is closing between them and their competitors, just in terms of the overall package that their products represent, they've still got the legacy OEMs beaten for sort of efficiency and range. But they also still haven't addressed some of my ongoing frustrations with their cars in terms of, you know, sort of build quality and general sense of premiumness. Oh, you, you could have the Tesla fanboys after you. Oh, God, I know. I, I've done it again. Resting on their laurels, perhaps a bit harsh to say, but where on earth is that Model 2? I mean, that car would take them into another stratosphere relative to their, to their competitors. And this was always Elon's master plan, right? He laid it out from the very get-go. Step one, uh, relatively low volume, quite expensive car. That's the Model S. Turned out to not be that low volume. Step two, sort of higher volume, middling price car. That's the Model 3. Huge success. And then the next step is that you take all that money and you build the small affordable car that brings electrification to the masses. Um, you know, the thing about Tesla is they'll, they'll just drop it. They'll just drop it one day with absolutely no prior warning, but we'll feel very silly for doubting them. Um, but it is, it's been a long old wait and the robots and the flamethrowers and the cyber trucks and the roadsters are just distractions and really for me do nothing for the company's um, credibility. You know, this whole model of kind of unveiling a car with absolutely no um, timeline for when customers are going to receive vehicle they've pre-ordered is uh, problematic. <laughs> I like that. That's a nice diplomatic word there. Problematic. Uh, I want to change tack a little bit uh, now. Tell me something about the Fully Charged show that most people listening wouldn't know and would go, ooh, I never knew that. For example, did you know Andy Torbert is a working stuntman on some of the largest franchises currently being filmed? Action Man Andy, yeah, he is actually he is actually all those things. I think he did a few of the James Bond films. Um, and. Uh, when he was at Fully Charged Live a couple of weeks ago, he had driven down from Glasgow the night before. He was, he was on set of a movie in Glasgow, presumably being thrown down some stairs at two o'clock on Friday night. And at eight o'clock on Saturday morning, he was on stage being annoyingly charismatic and funny. Um, he is a remarkable human being, it's true. Let's see, what else might you not know about the inner workings? Robert is he's just as sweet as you think. That's really naff to say, but I always, I always want to tell as many people that as possible. Everything that you would hope and expect from an interaction with Robert Llewellyn, it's, it's all of that and more. I think the thing that I really love about this company, uh, the thing that gets me out of bed on days when I'm feeling demotivated is that it is being run by two genuine, hardcore climate change activists. Between Robert and Dan, these are not two guys who are doing this because They've spotted a trend that you know could be uh, capitalized upon financially. They are hippies, and you know, whenever I'm overseas on a shoot, we get a bunch of comments from our audience going, "Oh, flying around the world to talk about electric vehicles? Are you?" That's ironic. The irony is not lost on us, and we spend long, long, long conversations discussing how do we reduce our carbon footprint as a company. Um, we say no to four out of five international press launches that we get invited to, which is very annoying for me because most of them are sort of lovely five-star hotels dotted around Europe. <laughs> but it's, uh, you know, we've got to pick our battles here and, um, and walk the walk. And you know, because Robert is so, so genuinely passionate about this cause, we've cultivated an audience of 1 million subscribers who are also truly passionate about this cause. Uh, I would, I would, argue that the fully charged audience is very different to that of most automotive YouTube channels because they, like Robert, are sort of climate change activists first and car nerds second. 
which again is a sort of rod for our own back. It means that if I drive a hundred thousand pound fast electric Porsche, no one bats an eyelid. But if I drive a golf buggy with a solar panel on the roof, everyone loses their minds. So that's what, that's what we try to focus on. <laughs> Fantastic. Now, I chatted with your mother recently. Uh, now, for the listeners, it's a long story, but the short version is she's lovely. She's very proud of her son and her daughter, who also works on the Fully Charged show. If you went to either of the Fully Charged live events, you'll have seen her with the Black Crew t-shirt. She's the tall one, of course. Uh, now, your mother told me you're actually an actor rather than a presenter. Any regrets about moving more into presenting than acting? Yeah, oh, God, I, I knew my mum would find some way of uh, <laughs> causing me embarrassment on this podcast. Uh, no, I, I, I was a very, very mediocre actor for a very short period of time. I studied English literature and drama at university, and I, I wanted to be an actor more than anything else until the age of sort of 22, 23. Um, and I think, fortunately for myself, I arrived at the realization that I wasn't especially good and that it was unlikely to happen fairly early on instead of subjecting myself through my entire twenties to kind of endless rejection. Uh, I, I remember the exact moment I realized it wasn't going to happen to me for me. I did, uh, I studied acting in California for a year as part of my degree and I had this wonderful, but brutally honest acting teacher. He was incapable of sugarcoating. And he came and watched me in a two person play. And I remember I, I, I saw him after the show and I was so nervous about what he was going to say. And he looked me in the eye, he shook my hand and he said, you did some good work out there. And I was like, oh, that's, he's tried so hard there to be nice, but I know exactly what that means. That means you hated most of it, didn't you? So. I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely, I, I adore being on a stage and mucking around. A comedy was always my favorite. I think that's why Robert and I gel so well because, you know, we similarly don't take it too seriously when we're doing these car videos. We want it to be fun and entertaining. And so creatively, I'm getting my kicks where I am. I feel much more comfortable doing what I'm doing. It comes a lot more naturally to me. So yeah, no, uh, no BBC sitcom for me in the near future. Unfortunately, I'm not quite as multi-talented as our founder. But you did manage to get the Wes Anderson pastiche going with the uh, Fully Charged Live in Farnborough, didn't you? I saw that. That was an excellent vi little video. Did you enjoy doing that? I loved doing that. It, we have such a ridiculously creative and talented production team. I, I would say they're the un unsung heroes of Fully Charged, but I think they're quite well sung because the comments of all of our videos kind of marvel at the staggering production value. Um, some very, very talented dudes. And uh, and I just I just love working with them. You know, Robert's background is TV and he runs Fully Charged like a small TV production company. You don't necessarily have to do that to do well on YouTube. In fact, financially, it makes more sense to do it you know, with a GoPro on a selfie stick like many YouTube creators do very successfully. But I love um, the pride in which he takes in the quality of our work and the fact that we're willing to spend a little bit extra for the slightly nicer camera and the slightly more talented videographer. And I think it, you know, the, the results speak for themselves. Did you wish you'd gone and done the Emmerdale episode instead of Robert and Imogen? I think you and Imogen on that would have been fantastic. <laughs> I, I've never seen five seconds of that show in my entire life. So I, I, I'm, I was quite relieved I wasn't called up for that one because I was terrified that I'd find myself kind of face to face with the star of the show and um, would, you know, mistake him for a runner and ask him for a coffee. So I, I've swerved that one, I think. I've got stories for you, which I'll tell you offline. But uh, uh, other than that, um, I think that's all my questions. Many thanks, Jack. Fantastic conversation. Always good to talk to you. Always a pleasure, Gary. Thank you. A couple of takeaways from this. We all know that there are OEMs who haven't embraced the EV ethos as well as, say, Tesla or even Volkswagen. But Jack thinks that there's a benefit to being second mover in a market such as this. Maybe Toyota, Mazda or Honda will surprise us. Secondly, the focus as we move forward needs to be smaller, cheaper cars or mini vehicles, such as the, the Microlino, the Ami, and e-bikes, e-cargo bikes, for example. We need to have fewer cars on the road overall, not just swap every internal combustion engine car for an electric vehicle. Finally, Tesla, the 800 pound gorilla in the EV room, are resting a little on their laurels and could really make even more of a mark on the market if they managed to release the rumoured low-priced Model 2. I, I did check the Fully Charged Show YouTube channel to see if I could determine how many car reviews Jack's done. 
He has his own playlist, which has 86 videos, but as he said, they're not all car review ones. 21 of them cover topics which are EV related, but not strictly car review. And in and amongst there are a couple of episodes of Almost Breaking News, where he chats with Robert Llewellyn. So the answer is 65, which isn't bad at all. Many thanks to Jack for his time, a great discussion. I think you'll agree. It's time for a cool EV or renewable thing to share with your listeners. If you're a follower of the so-called van life YouTube channels, you'll know that taking something like a transit van, a Mercedes e-sprinter or a Volkswagen van, ripping the stuff out of the back and refitting it to live in is a lifestyle choice many embrace. Up until now, the lack of range on many electric vans has stymied this move for EV owners. But fully charged life showed what can be done with the right vehicle and some ingenuity. Using a VWID buzz, a company called TT Conversions created the D-Van Buzz. It gives buyers the option of an entry-level electric camper based on the ID Buzz Cargo and a more well-equipped version based on the ID Buzz Life. The new camper van family includes a full-size pop-up roof, an all-electric gas-free equipment setup, up to four sleeping berths, a clever indoor-outdoor kitchen, and solar charging. TC augments VW's 111 kilowatt hour traction battery with a 160 amp hour lithium leisure battery meant to run the camper side of the equation. That leisure battery receives power from, one, from a 165 watt solar panel mounted on the pop-up roof and sends power to a 3000 watt inverter and appliances like the single hob induction cooker and 20 litre Vitrifrigo top loading fridge box. The gas-free D-Van Buzz is designed to run efficiently off-grid, but it also includes a hookup for plugging into shore power. I saw this in person at Fully Charged Life and really liked it. Friend of the podcast, Rob Shaw, is currently in the negotiation to borrow one of these for a weekend to make a video. So keep an eye on his channel when he releases that. The EV Musings podcast is sponsored by ZapMap, the go-to app for EV drivers in the UK, which helps EV drivers search, plan, and pay for their charging. ZapMap is free to download and use with subscription plans for enhanced features such as using ZapMap in car, on CarPlay, or Android Auto. And that's the show for today. Hope you enjoyed listening to it. If you want to contact me, I can be emailed at evmusings at gmail.com. I'm also on Twitter at MusingsEV. If you want to support the podcast and newsletter, please consider contributing to becoming an EV Musings patron. The link is in the show notes. Don't want to sign up for something on a monthly basis? If you enjoyed this episode, why not buy me a coffee? Go to coffee.com slash evmusings and you can do just that. ko-fi.com slash evmusings. Takes Apple Pay too. I have a couple of ebooks out there if you want something to read on your Kindle. So, you've gone electric. It's available on Amazon Worldwide for the measly sum of 99p or equivalent and it's a great little introduction to living with an electric car. So, you've gone renewable is also available on Amazon for the same 99p and it covers installing solar panels, a storage battery and a heat pump. Why not check them out? Links for everything we've talked about in the podcast today are in the description. If you enjoy this podcast, please subscribe. It's available on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Please leave a review as it helps raise visibility and extend our reach in search engine. If you've reached this part of the podcast and are still listening, thank you. Why not let me know you got to this point by tweeting me at Musing CV with the words on the same wavelength. Hashtag, if you know, you know, nothing else. Thanks, as always, to my co-founder, Simon. You know, he got into a little domestic trouble recently when his wife decided she wanted to get into content creation herself. She started her own little YouTube channel, The EV Widow. It's tales of her time alone while he's out on the electric unicycle, etc. She even wrote Simon's mother into it, who told a very funny story about Simon's first day at school and an incident with a nun, a blackboard eraser, and a frog. As you can imagine, Simon was not happy. Oh, God. I I knew my mum would find some way of uh, causing me embarrassment on this podcast. Thanks for listening. Bye. Bye.